Welcome to uh, this breakout session on leadership and planning. And this one is focused on um, the life cycle of camps, how they start, how they change, and how they fall apart, and how there's life after the end of your camp. Um, we've got a, a panel of uh, longtime theme camp uh, participants and leaders. And uh, I, I think we'll go ahead and introduce everybody. Courtney, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Hi, I'm. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your burn history? Okay. Yeah, my name is Courtney. My apply name is Bean, so you can call me whatever you prefer. Um, but burn history. So I started. Uh, my first burn was in 2013, and I've been going basically every year since. Um, I originally camped with a camp called Tetris that was right on the Esplanade, and. Um, was really inspired by my first year. And then um, the year after that, me and a bunch of friends co-founded a camp called LED Dinosaur. Um, so we are a camp that has um, sound at night, um, a bar day into night, uh, lectures and yoga during the day. And um, yeah, we've been doing that. We've been placed every year since 2015. So I've co-led that camp um, with a couple other leaders in our camp. And then in 2019, um, we got to be so big that we um, turned into a village and kind of split into four different camps. So um, in regards to this conversation, my leadership experience um, in camps, I've led or co-led camps anywhere from 25 um, to 125 people. And then our village um, this year is slated to be a 185 people. So um, I have experience on kind of the more the larger end of um, camps and villages. And um, I'm just stoked to be here and to learn more from the other panel members because everything I've ever learned from Burning Man has been from somebody that's done it before me and they've passed that knowledge to me. Um, so I'm really excited to hear what everyone else has to say and hopefully um, my experience can be um, useful as well. Cool, all right. Elisa, do you wanna check in? Sure. So um, my name is Elizabeth Mansky. I've been a part of Costume Cult uh, since 2012. 2012 was my first big burn. I've been burner adjacent actually since I've been a teenager. So a huge part of my entire life has been um, close to or a part of the community. And my, uh, my tenure over the past decade plus has really been more... Um, participatory in a non-leadership capacity. So I've done event curation, event production for like our fundraising events in New York City. I've done decor work. I've done a um, variety of tasks for our local New York community here. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed our, our sort of core costume cult leadership team is that since COVID has happened, so many critical camps have sort of fallen away or changed or dissolved in some way. And it really sort of galvanized um, the community and myself to sort of like take a more substantial leadership role. So um, this will be my first year being one of the main camp leads for Costume Cult. And if people are unfamiliar with our mission, we, um, we are an Esplanade camp. We uh, collect thousands of costumes every year and bring about five containers out to Playa full of all sorts of things to gift to the community. So it is uh, the smallest camp, the smallest costume cult camp I've been a part of in 2012 was about 130 people. We've gone as high as about 250. And I think the sweet spot being around 175 to 200. Um, so yeah, pretty big camp, um, learned a lot. And I've always been a part of that community since, uh, since my first, first burn. So it's pretty exciting. Okay. Uh, Bill, you wanna check in? Yeah, hey everybody. Um, Bill Gilman, AKA Massive here. I uh, went to my first burn in 2003, but didn't really understand what uh, the, a camp is really the heart of your whole experience until 2006. And then it really changed we began the, a whole new understanding of what Burning Man was and, you know, kind of how involved I got into it. Um, we, we organically built a camp after that. And then once my wife and I started bringing our, our children, we went to Kidsville for a couple of years. 
And then we actually took the Black Rock Explorers camp or program and, and made it a standalone camp next to Kidsville in 2018 and 2019, where we take kids and their families behind the scenes around Black Rock City. So it's been a bunch of different types of camps, um, a lot of family camp experience. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to see where it'll go. And I'd be happy to talk about uh, Renegade Burn if anyone's interested too, and in my experiences out there. Okay, uh, now, uh, Leslie, you, uh, although you're not technically a panel participant, I'd, I'd appreciate if you gave a little of your background too. Sure, um, hi everybody, I'm Leslie. Client name is Leslie, or oftentimes, hi, I'm Leslie, or this is Leslie. As camp leads, you probably are on conference calls and Zoom meetings, and you say that all the time. So that has sort of become, I think, a de facto play name for me. Um, I've been burning since 2012, um, and you know, got hooked very quickly, as many of us have. And then I was with a larger camp from 2012 through 2014, and then myself and three other folks decided to do a a, a go in a different direction and we started a much smaller camp called 3SP, Third Space Place. And our concept is your first place is your home, your second place is your office, and your third place is your community space, whether that be a coffee shop or like a, you know, zen place to hang out or a local bar or bowling alley. That's clearly gone out the window now with COVID, but <laughs> Changing that is for another day. Anyway, we started that camp in 2015 and we are, are fairly small. We usually go between about uh, 13 to 25 people, depending on the year. And I am, all, I am a camp lead and I actually am interested in hearing everybody's perspectives in this particular panel myself, in addition to being today's chat moderator. So I can go over um, a couple uh, guidelines for chat moderating. I'll just jump into that right now, if that's okay. And then I'll drop those into the chat after I finish saying them. So just a few guidelines. You probably already heard these if you have been in previous uh, breakout panels today. Just please mute your, mute your mic if you're not a speaker. That would be great. Um, if you've got a comment or a question, um, please feel free to type it in the chat. But we do have sort of a fairly small group right now. I think we've got about 20 participants. So if you feel comfortable doing a hand raise on Zoom, you could do that. And I'll try to pay attention to that and um, pull out your question or like call out to you so that you can ask your question of the panelists. Be respectful in your participation. Be present. We're all here to learn from one another. Um, so let's be gracious with our attention. Speak from your own experience as a camp lead. And um, again, I'll bring in your questions and comments um, via the chat or try to call on you if I see your hand raise. So with that, I will toss it back to you, Captain Vic. Okay, uh, I'm Captain Vic, uh, Vic Stevens. I've been uh, attending Burning Man since 02. I started uh, as a team camp leader in 03 and I've done that ever since. Uh, the camp is the Children of Chaos. Uh, about uh, nine years ago, two other camps dissolved that we were friendly with, and we picked up members from them. And so basically, it was a merger of three camps, and we went from about 15 to about 30, and then up to about 45. I think this year we'll have about 35. We do all kinds of different events, uh, uh, performance art, uh, guerrilla theater, costume stuff, silly stuff. In any case, I'll be the, the moderator, the chair today, I guess. Um, uh, I, it, please send uh, your questions to Leslie and um, we can proceed. Do we, do we have any yet, Leslie? No? Okay. We do so, not. Yeah, so uh, let's see, uh, whoever, one of, somebody on the panel should start here and talk about what they think is probably the most important uh, concern when we're talking about changing leadership. There are a number of camps uh, are changing leadership this year um, that two years off have made, uh, have gone for a lot of stresses. And so I wonder if uh, somebody on the panel could talk about uh, what their experiences have been, what works and what doesn't work when you're changing leadership in a camp.
my think, experience, go, go ahead, ahead please. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Um, I mean, I think it's important to start with, um, this is something I learned through leadership at the burn and then have parlayed it um, more into my uh, more default life and, and work. But I think like the first thing to understand is that the growth and decay or like change of leadership and individuals at the camp is completely normal and organic. And it's something that should be really embraced. And I've found the most success with our camp when um, we haven't tried to get in the way of that change, despite how like we might have personally felt about it. Um, so I can give a more um, real life example. So in 2019, when we um, started to become a village, it was very um, personal and there was some like conflict because um, key leaders, it was essentially our leadership team that wanted to start their own camps. And um, there was like concern over what that would mean for LED Dino, the camp that, that I still camp in um, and co-lead. And what actually was, ended up happening is um, uh, like literally nothing bad. Like once we let go of the idea that other people could step, step into leadership positions and really embrace that and then support um, our ex Dino camp members in their new passion, um, our burn became a lot more rich because we got to see like them do what they wanted to do. Like one of my girlfriends wanted to make a, a dumpling speakeasy camp. And that was just like, not it, like there was no way to make that mission work with our like bar and sound camp that runs all day. So I, like, I think like the first thing that just needs to be recognized is like, really like embracing the change. It's totally normal. It is like no reflection on your leadership or you as a camp mate or your camp. It's just kind of natural. Um, and I think if you start from that place, um, it's a lot easier to kind of tackle the very like specific ch challenges that come with um, switching in and out leadership. I hope that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree. I mean, I, I think, you know, when it's organic, when there's a lot of communication, then it's easy for everyone to just find out what everyone else needs. And then you find the solution kind of emerges naturally. Um, I was part of a pretty bad camp breakup uh, when we went to, when we went to Kidsville and it was all my fault. And it was because I didn't, I, I was resisting wanting things to change and I didn't want to hurt anyone's feelings and I didn't want to really break the situation up, but I was also resentful and da, 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 da. And it was all these really complex emotions. And the moment I started talking with everyone about it, it took care of itself. And, and everyone already knew, you know, I mean, we're all pretty perceptive people. So like the moment, you know, I mean, it, it took a moment for everyone to kind of figure out what they wanted, but it all, it all just started working itself out the moment there was communication. Yeah, and and when you say when you say communication, tell us a little more about how that was done. Really, just what your wants and needs are, and what's changed, and why, and really keeping it focused on yourself is probably the best idea of what you know. Even if you're disappointed with someone else, you say, "Look, I'm disappointed," you know, with the way these things turned out specifically, you know. But blaming other people and turning it on them and making it their fault is, you know, of course it's going to end in ruin. So, um, so I would, you know. Just take responsibility for what's yours, including what you want to see change. And, you know, if you're if someone's hurt feelings are going to get hurt, chances are that's really not about you either. You know, all you can do is control what what you are and what you need with the most grace and kindness that you can. And uh, I mean, I could get specific about the situation, but ultimately it just came down to the fact that we were going to Kidsville the following year and. I wanted both, you know, I wanted my old camp, but I also wanted this new experience. And, um, you know, I mean, when, when you kind of see things, when you see yourself making strange decisions or silly decisions, then it's easy to kind of carve through them. But when you're just suppressing it, not even thinking about it, not giving it your time, of course, you know, it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna affect everything. <laughs> One of the things that we've, um, we've experienced with the change of leadership at Costume Cult is the um, the push to sort of really protect our campers from burnout. And the idea of 
making sure that all of the institutional knowledge doesn't just live in the hands of a few people. So the idea of um, spreading the knowledge around and like really empowering the new person and empowering people to sort of take on more responsibility so we can create a succession pipeline. That's like one of the biggest things that we're leaning into right now. And I can talk more about that a bit later, but um, change of leadership, you know, it's, it's not necessarily just about um, people having conflict. It, it could be just about people needing to take a break or people wanting to have a different burn experience. Um, and, you know, running quite a large camp like ours, like I was saying, our camp has been up to 250 people. The idea of just getting really exhausted. I mean, it's a year round project for all of us. I'm sure it is true for all of you as well. Um, but spreading the love and the workload um, and empowering leadership to come up in different areas has been something that's been really important for us as well. Could you give a little more detail about how you, uh, the mentoring or the, the development of, of leadership skills in, in new people? I, uh, how do you bring them in? How's that done? Yeah, so um, there's a couple of things that we really have been leaning into this year, especially. So Costume Cult always has a very strong push um, towards acculturation. So we really, uh, and try to empower and educate and um, ex explain, you know, what the 10 principles are, how uh, participatory culture operates. Like we are a year round organization and we try to fold in any new and interested burners into what we do all year round. So the idea of acculturation and understanding participatory culture um, holistically is really critical for us. And what that ends up looking like is, you know, in tactically, we've created a mentorship program for our new baby burners, basically. So the veteran burners can adopt a baby burner and um, kind of guide them and be sort of a, a resource for them if they have questions, if they want to know what kind of tent to get, if they, you know, any, any kind of basic questions. So they have like a built-in resource on top of <laughs> sort of like making friends with people in the camp as well. So that's like one thing that we we are leaning into especially hard this year. Um, second is, you know, creating opportunities for people to shine. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same camp every year with the same, uh, the same you know, exact activities. So allowing, creating an, and allowing a platform for people to be creative and for people to um, express their own wants and needs under the guise of the camp has been something that we've really found to be very important and very successful. At Loveburn, we basically ran an experiment to see how, um, how it would go if we just sort of like created this platform and empowered the new people to just shine in a way that they wanted to. And what we saw was they just went above and beyond anything that we could have imagined. So, you know, making them feel supported, making them feel empowered. Um, and, you know, just being sort of the, uh, the support system as, as a lead and not necessarily like a top-down instructional force has really allowed us to build leadership um, qualities in these new people. One of our virgins actually, um, he's never been to any burn and he's an international participant as well. So it was even doubly hard for him to engage, um, you know, in a, in a standard way, he created an entire new programming for Costume Cult um, remotely. And he, uh, you know, our, our initial gift is costuming and, and he created a drag show and he created a burlesque show and fire performances. And it was, it was so wonderful to see. And that would have never happened if we had a very strict mandate on exactly how we want to express our gift. We had like a framework and we just wanted to make our campers feel empowered. And, and what we got out of that was just absolutely magical. Yeah, we, we actually have a, like a lot of parallels with our camp as well. We have a mentorship program where we bring a lot of virgins and we, we feel it's really like important to bring new good people and make sure they understand um, the principles and be a good burner as well. So we have like dino moms and dads. So if you bring somebody like you're responsible 
for them. And you have to make sure like you vouch for them, first of all, from like a screening perspective, but then you also like teach them about the principles and, um, and you know, how to be a good burner. Um, but in terms of like burnout, um, we also, from a more like tactical standpoint, we try to keep, we have leads for each project that we, we work on. Um, it sounds similar to costume cult too, but, um, and we try to have co-leads on each so we can kind of like diversify, um, the leadership responsibility. And then, um, typically we get like, um, a f like a few years out of leaders typically. Um, so, uh, but we also diversify the leadership so that we can, um, when somebody, like goes through a life event or wants to change the way that they burn or they don't want to take on that responsibility anymore. There's other knowledge that has been spread at the top. Um, and then we do the same thing where we really encourage people to like um, make our camp better. Like we want people to bring their ideas and just like be a vehicle for them to express that. Um, and that has really changed the direction of our camp as well. Um, and I think it's like a really great exercise and just like letting go of control of like what you imagine your camp to be and just, um, seeing how it lives and breathes and like what it can actually become. Um, but diversifying the, the different leaders and then people on the team really helps start to build that knowledge so that when there are changes, it's less volatile. Yeah, I, I would say that, um, that. Being, being part of leadership of pretty much every camp I've ever been in post 2006, um, that stepping back and just, you know, creating a little bit of a vacuum, people will step in. If you're constantly saying, well, looks like no one's doing this, so how about we do that, you know, and constantly trying to control it, um, it, it, it's, you know, it's doomed to fail. Um, or not to fail, it's just, it's very controlling, I should say. Um, one thing that, that we did with, with Explorers Camp, it was about 85 each year, the two years we did it. And we were very open to families. We only asked that they not be fully virgin families, that they had at least camped in Kidsville once. Um, and, and so it was a lot of people we didn't know. And it was, um, we didn't, you know, we didn't know firsthand until we got to know them. And um, that became a really self-selecting thing where um, the people who, the families who really wanted to get involved with camp, you know, organization and with, you know, cooking and all the different areas uh, became very apparent. And then the other ones just kind of stayed on the, on the outskirts. And so what came out of that this next year, we're going to be a village um, our, our, our theme camp itself is basically the core group that came from explorers with a few extra people. And, um, you know, we're looking at like 25 to 30 people, which I think is actually a really good camp size. I think, you know, camps scale with, with the ability to kind of wrangle cats. Right. And, um, and so getting smaller again has really made me excited, but then we're also part of a village. So we're also part of a, a larger group and having those kind of those clear, clear boundaries make, make really good neighbors, I think. Um, and also this is something I heard years ago and I've only seen it proven true again and again. And it's obviously not every camp, um, but you know, it said sometimes camps will last three, four, five, maybe six years, and then they'll naturally split up and become other parts of other camps. And or new camps and they kind of having an understanding that that's a natural that's one natural you know life cycle time frame is is really helped me out because it didn't put this pressure on me to think that whatever we have now has to keep going forever and um it's you know it's 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 supposed to be new and no one goes to the playa to have the same experience they had before right so it needs to be a whole new not whole new but you know new new enough that, that it keeps it fascinating and just interesting. So I hope that yeah, helps. To uh, just to piggyback on that, you made me think of a really good point um, that we've noticed is that for us, you know, there's, and, and for every camp, there's a lot of things that just constantly need to get done. We have a very long laundry list of things that need to happen in order for the camp to exist. And when we're 
talking about the new person and trying to empower the new person to take on a leadership responsibility, it's not necessarily just getting the thing done. It's empowering and entrusting the new person who may want to do the thing a different way and being open to doing the thing a different way. Um, and so sometimes we get in our own heads about like, okay, well, this is so urgent. I need to do it immediately. There's not enough time. This person doesn't operate on the same schedule as me. I'm just going to do it myself. I'm just going to do it myself. Um, and reframing that whole philosophy and saying like, well, the goal is not just to get things done. The goal is to be a guide and to, to share your knowledge with the new person and keep an open mind that the camp is going to evolve a little bit every year and the process is going to evolve every, a little bit every year. And the reality is we might actually learn something from the new person who's coming in with fresh eyes. And so having that perspective and having um, the openness is actually just beneficial for everyone all around. It's beneficial for that person who's feeling empowered, who's feeling like we have a sense of trust in them. It's beneficial for us because it's taking some weight off of our backs. And um, it really just helps us grow as thought partners. Uh, Leslie, do we have questions, fresh questions coming in? We do not have any fresh questions in the chat, but that is a great opportunity for those who are participating. If you have any questions, if you wanna raise your hand or drop something in the chat, that would be great. I mean, and while maybe folks are thinking of something, I'm happy to give my two cents on sort of the concept of the burnout, which I think for me personally is very acute. <laughs> um, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm part of a, a smaller camp and I think the smaller camps, even though there might ostensibly be less maybe less cats to herd or less things to do, it actually winds up becoming fewer people are doing mo most of the things. Um, that's been my experience uh, very much so. Um, I've heard also sort of to touch a little bit on your point, Bill, I've heard that the mantra here and there that like the average camp at Burning Man lives for seven years. And I think that is probably very true that many camps disappear before the seven, some camps live past that. But I think what you all have been saying has resonated very much with me. And I wasn't even like thinking, I mean, I was like more interested in doing the chat moderating, but hey, <laughs> um, I do think just being able to accept that these are life cycles and camps while not living things are constantly evolving and changing they're never going to be the same because the burn is never the same. I think you all have both, like three or four of you actually have touched on that same concept. And I think that's really, really good for me to, to as a takeaway. I, I am curious what smaller camps do in terms of any succession planning. Um, Cause I do think, like I mentioned before, maybe with bigger camps, I don't want to say it's easier because it's a whole different set of challenges, but if you've got just sort of a, a smaller core group of people, um, if anyone has thoughts on that, I'd be curious to hear what you all have to say. And also again, questions, raise your hand, drop them in the chat. I, I think that, you know, most, most burners are pretty open and pretty, um, you know, have a lot of uh, empathy. And so, so it's, it's kind of easy to see what's going on with each other, even when there's, when there's a lot of static or a lot of drama. Um, and so you can kind of see, I, I feel like you can see when splits are starting to occur and, in smaller camps, I should say. Um, with, and so it kind of just makes sense that people at the end of the burn go, okay, because chances are they're going into the burn with some kind of thought of you know, possibilities. And then the burn, that burn, that year's burn kind of uh, you know, convinces them or, or reassures them that the choice that they're making is the one that they wanted or maybe something changes but but then that way at the end of the burn it's kind of everyone just automatically checks in and goes well here's what i'm thinking for next year you know um and it's actually when there's when there's not communication happening that that doesn't happen and so that might play out through the middle of the year um i think that like i said that the, the only really bad breakup i've seen is um is when was I wasn't talking to people. Um, before that, you know, people would just kind of be like, oh, I think I'm gonna go camp with this camp next year. And because if it's, you know, 25, 30, maybe even 50 people, you know, a, a group of 10 or some percentage 
breaking away doesn't really change the arithmetic that much, you know? Because um, everyone kind of knows the role they're already playing. But it does leave open opportunities and new, new people to come in. And um, yeah, I think with, with, well, keeping it on small, I was gonna say with larger camps, I have no idea how that happened. <laughs> but I guess with larger camps, there's a lot of communication already through the people running it or else it wouldn't come together at all. I do have a comment, if I can raise this from May or May Not, which is a brilliant name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> love it. Um, mentioning that um, trying to figure out how to start unraveling um, our camp and not quitting, but making it more attractive to possible new leaders or owners. And I know, again, some of you all have touched on you know, mentoring and having like sort of baby burners learn different things and co-leads. Are, are there other ideas that folks might have regarding actually making the step up to a leadership, a prominent leadership role in a camp more attractive? I have thoughts, but if may or may not want to like expand on the current situation, maybe we could yeah. be more helpful. Wow, guys, thank you. Um, you know, there was always a joke. Hi, everybody. There was always a joke about sort of like, how much could we pay somebody to take this camp off of our hands? You know, <laughs> and <clears throat> when I when I look at the when, you know, I, I inherited two guys from Black Rock, Connecticut in a five by 10 storage unit. And we have a 53 foot tractor trailer now and a, and a flatbed probably this year. Um, we probably have five miles of extension cords. Um, I, I, I'm considering moving to Reno for a year just to take on, you know, let's say it's 50 or $60,000 worth of investment um, to, to scale it and really take some time to like, you know, if somebody needs it for a crisis or God forbid we get tired to carry it a bar, um, it's easy to deploy. Other camp members can have access to that shit that's been sitting there for three years. Uh, so yeah, I'm really like, again, I'm going to, I think I'm going to move to Reno, just go live with the camp for, for a while, just to make it simplify it and to make it really not plug and play. I mean, not that, but it, but it plug and play in the sense of if I'm out a year or two, uh, the, the other guys can come in and, and, and do the whole thing. And it's not all resting on me. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Levy, did you want to say something or? I'll say something. I, that so, sounds like a really challenge, a hell of a challenge to, to deal with all that equipment with somebody that's new to the process. I would think you'd, you'd have to have them apprentice for a couple of years for that big an operation. Maybe I'm wrong about that. You know, Captain, um, we've been very lucky. Um, we, we haven't lost too many members along the way. Uh, we've grown slowly. You know, we started with 27 where where with, who comes to visit camp now is probably, you know, comes to stay with us is between 120 and 150. Now my core camp members, 60 of us, um, the build crew that's like the hardcore build crew first on site, eight to 10 of us, um, they've been pretty consistent through the years. So, um, you know, it's pretty, I always say like, you know, if I die this year, take my leg to the, to the temple. Um, I'm, I'm, Johnny and I, my, my co-lead, we, we feel more confident than ever that, that if something happened to us, everybody else kind of knows what the fuck to do. Uh, but in, in that regard too, it would be irresponsible of me not to have a will, right? Um, some way to figure out how the transfer of all those assets go to someone else in, in an easy, clean sort of way so that they can, they can pick up the torch and keep running with it. So you find a co-leadership model works for you? You know, it's mostly happenstance. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of the cheerleader and the person who, uh, I'm the pollinator. I'm the one who travels around the, the country and around the world and visits everybody and keeps everybody in touch and, and finds good talent. And then Johnny's, uh, you know, he's, he's the camp engineer. Like he's, if I say, hey, I want a floating fire disco, like, he, you know, he, he builds it or he finds somebody who, who, who can build it. Um, uh, we got Sparky or, or Good Copy, my electrician, you know, those, he's stayed on for, they've been on for years now. Um, and so once those guys start, to, they don't understand what, what a lot of us TCOs understand, which is the really hard part about sort of like 
what am I supposed to call you the day of the direct direct group sale and and hold like oh hey the sales on now go log on and then they're like oh you didn't tell me it's like I told you three times and you had to sign up for it like how much hold, hand holding do I have to do and the other one is fundraising which I absolutely despise um, we call it camp contributions because we've got some long standing uh, anarchy streaks which are like it's not camp dues because we're not we're going to try to decommodify that whole process. Uh, but at the same time, I'd like to see financial skin in the game. Um, and that's that's the really hard part. Now, that's the part I think that if there was some succession that people would find out that was that was difficult and challenging and, and something they've never done. You know, organizing the nuts and bolts, that's one thing. I think what you're bringing up is amazing. It's it's really the the kind of the, the weight of a camp and it crosses emotional and, you know, functionary and just all the stuff and having that stuff to deal with every year and not knowing if, if you got hit by a truck tomorrow, what, what would happen with that stuff? I'm in the same boat. And um, I, I think that it's like any other problem, like you just have to put time, work and thought to it. Um, I think, I mean, you sounds like you already have a pretty clear idea of who, I mean, you know who your core is. You could, without having a handhold, you could put the direct question out there and say, hey, I mean, why not game it out? Say, if I got hit by a truck, what would happen? And see what your campmates say, right? I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do that today. Because I think it's a great conversation. And I think it's also something we should probably as theme camp organizers talk about, you know, if some camp's coming up and they wanna buy a bunch of stuff and another camp's, you know, getting smaller, why not hand it off to each other and, you know, make that an event? Um, so, I, I think really th what I've done for myself is I've just been like, dude, relax. It's all going to sit in empire for another year. It's all going to be like, and it's going to cost money and it's going to, and, but yet I know that if I put the word out, people will step up and it just requires doing that. That's kind of a vague answer, but it's also probably one you're used to, right? I mean, it's something that we've been doing the whole time we've been going to Burning Man is kind of throwing the question out there and we live with that question until it answers itself. Um, does anyone else have a better specific response? Can, well, it uh, might, can, oh, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah. I, I can just speak to sort of a little bit of how we frame it in, in a larger camp um, at Costume Cold. So the way that we look at being sort of a, a camp leadership team is we don't look at it as our job to do all the things. And we look at it as our job to sort of like harmonize what everyone else, what everyone is doing. So the idea of like creating a camp where everyone feels equally engaged, feels like they have equal ownership stake in the creation of the art and the experience is really critical. And I understand that this is something that is not something that happens overnight. This takes time and this is this is an organizational structure issue. Um, but we found that when everybody feels equally engaged and people feel equally responsible, everyone has a job, right? So like all of the main components of camp are live, live within a team. And then within each team, it is broken down into projects. So I can give you an example. We have a DPW team in, in Costume Cult. So DPW is responsible for the electrical, the water, the shade, um, the infrastructure of camp. So we have all of that there. So we have a DPW team lead who sort of oversees the umbrella of everything. And then there's smaller projects within that. We have a quartermaster who handles all of our tools. Um, we have someone who handles all of the electrical. So it's it's actually serves multiple purposes. It really alleviates the strain and the worry from just the few people that are sort of like overseeing the larger camp. And it also empowers those people to feel like they have equal stake in the game. So the person who's handling, you know, the electrical, the person who's handling the water, the person who's handling the shade and infrastructure. And it also gives them room to sort of like be creative and think about new ideas because when people get so burdened, as I'm sure you understand the, the burden and the weight of carrying all this stuff, it's really hard to think outside the box. It's hard to think about new ideas because you're just treading water trying to make sure everything gets done. So I, I would challenge you maybe think about re, like reimagining the organizational structure 
of, of the camp. And I know that it's a hard thing to do, um, but we found a lot of success in in that sort of like dividing everything into teams and then within teams, dividing everything into projects. And that way, every single person is engaged. Yeah, it works a lot better if everybody has a job. And, and I, I agree with you. And even in a small camp, uh, that makes a big difference. If everybody has a job, something that they're responsible for that they've agreed to take on and they're behind it, it things go way better. Yeah, and just to like close up may or may not question, I mean, it sounds like you're doing pretty good. Like, I don't think you can, like I just wrote out the only three things I could think of like tactically that you could do, which is like be extremely organized and like label all your shit, like try to get that as like together as possible. Um, like make sure that other people in your camp like know the process. So if you weren't there, someone can help. And then, um, if, and this is like totally contingent on how much time and like energy you like really have into like setting up for the future, basically by yourself or with your co-lead is any kind of like asynchronous documentation where you like document like how to do everything, either like recording it or creating a spec. That's the only other thing I can think of. But to Bill's point, it's like, we all know that if you put something out into the ether or like an idea or like start like, you know, like. Um, explaining to other burners like that your camp is open to new leadership and to take that like something's going to happen and it always happens um, like somehow at the right time and that's just how our community works but it sounds like you're doing really good <laughs> honestly hey thank you I didn't I didn't put it in the chat but at some point um, we became a village and it was like everybody just turned to me and go oh that's that's the mayor over there you know um, <laughs> I, you, you know I I inherited a camp that was you know once part of 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 pex before they split up years and years ago and and the rest of it and so there's there's an ego release like i mean the concept rancho sparkle pony that was my concept uh whether or not we even knew that we were going to have the support to do the camp by the third or fourth year i didn't know if we were if anybody was even going to want to camp with us but i had two other guys you know and i knew that we could build the camp and we did and those guys are still alive and they 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 know they have their parts of what they do, um, but I think you know I came across this subject at the Burning Man Intergalactic Leadership Conference years ago uh, of sort of like succession and the rest of it, and you know I I think, think thinking of it more in terms of like if I died tomorrow is a lot different than thinking I'm pulling my hair out and I'm not enjoying this anymore. True. <laughs> Well, in my experience, the camps, the camp leaders that burn out are the ones that try to do everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, uh, it's too much and it, you've got to spread it around. And um, the camps that I've watched fall apart, often it was because a, a leader just tried to do everything and then completely burned out. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it, it's much better if you've got things to dispersed and, and I like it that everybody has a job that because uh, one of the problems that we've had in the past was freeloaders, you know, people that just goof off and don't really contribute and uh, trying to prevent that by making sure everybody agrees to do something. We try to get them to volunteer to do something they're interested in. And that usually works really well. Yeah, another suggestion if you can, and you know, use any opportunity is create deadlines mid-year we just did Bequinox and it always, it amazes me that I forget this and that it is so astonishing each time it happens that leading up to a moment, uh, leading up to a, you know, regional, uh, anything like the, you know, the in Reno things that you have this opportunity to get people together and really focus. It's, it's hard for people to put a lot of focus, I think, into Burning Man, unless you're sworn to it um, mid-year because it's kind of tangential, right? And so... So having these these events that happen that you have to turn your attention to and that uh, you know it it's it's there's literally no substitution um, because otherwise I can basically get everyone super involved like two weeks before the burn uh, otherwise and you know we can have conversations and whatnot about things but until we're together like what physically is going to happen you know so that's just on the physical side I think you can have more you know, kind of spiritual and and philosophical conversations year round without well, i think it's important to do that is it is it about seven o'clock 
Uh, well, well, what it's time 3 is 30, it? It's three thirty. It's three thirty Pacific. Three thirty. Yeah. So I think we still right. have another half hour. But yeah, thirty minutes. Right. Yes. People want okay. to stick around. All right. Thank you. That's that's Jay. Jay, thank you for doing the technical side of this. I appreciate that. You are also a theme camp lead. Do you have anything you'd wanted to add to the uh, conversation at this point? Um, yeah, well, we've been through, I mean, our camp's been around in various forms for about 25 years. We, um, uh, we, we produce a Spark documentary, if people remember that, from back in 2012, 2013. Um, and it's been a sort of a constant of evolving um, thing. And what, what we've done well, I think, in the last four years is, is divide that responsibility up. Uh, before I encountered the camp, it did used to be just with a couple of people that were running the entire thing. Um, and then they they had a split up. They got divorced, which almost you know destroyed our camp. It, you know because those are the two main people, and they were fighting with each other, and it just wasn't going to happen again. So we basically got a collection of us, twelve of us, to basically take over the entire thing and fund it. And then we have what we call camp czars uh, to look after the different areas of the camp, and we also have what we call our crews. So because we've got some internationals, our, our Hong Kong crew, our St Thomas crew, our Marin crew, our Woodside crew. Each of those crews have got their, also their own responsibility and their own leaderships for what they're going to contribute to the camp. So we've found that we've, we've created a fairly good matrix of responsibility now um, so that, you know, if I did get hit by a bus, it really wouldn't be a problem. We've got shared files for everybody. Everybody knows the plans. Everybody knows the spreadsheets. So, you know, I think we're fairly resilient now compared to what we used to be. Um, but we learned that the hard way through a divorce. Well, that I hope you don't get a whole hit by other bus. issue. <laughs> uh, that it brings up a whole other issue too with personnel. Um, we had two major breakups this year, and um, you know I have my own policy of like how I'm going to deal with who wants to come back, and basically the the second person has to get consent from the first person. Uh, they have to agree to both be at the at camp together um, to do so. But it's you know it's damaging. We're we're out some we're out some aerial equipment. You know we're out some other things too. A oh, smoker. We're out of smoker. You know it's tough. <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah, I can speak to that too, because I found a dyno with my ex partner, and um, we still run it together. And it's like, hard. I mean, it's actually we're really good friends now. But it is something like when I went through it at the time, um, I felt very I hadn't heard that story before. And then now since I've like it ha has happened in like every camp I've ever heard of. Um, but the the biggest thing that I can say about that piece is that we like constantly have a choice on how we feel and sometimes it's like really hard to make the right choice and um and somehow like we just like chose even when it was like tense between us like in the the early um time from our breakup um we chose that like what we brought into the world was like a really beautiful thing it's like a child if you will and um, we really wanted to support that. And so like inside, we didn't like, like each other the first year, but then um, it actually like helped us um, become really good, like lifelong friends and kind of like mend all of that because we made like the bigger decision to like continue to support our camp together. Um, and yeah, it's turned into like one of the most beautiful things in my life. So um, I don't know, but if anyone's going through it, it's like, uh, it happens <laughs> literally every camp that I've heard of. So you're not alone. That's like for the, probably for the conflict session, but <laughs> thanks mayor. <laughs> so I have a, I have a question for Kate uh, from desk guild. If, if, if you don't mind, um, I mean, desk guilds, but one of the most longest running camps on Playa, um, is there anything you want to share about what we're talking about? I mean, I think I can um, echo a lot of what has been said. Um, I mean, I'm I'm not Marisa. Marisa is our fe fearless leader. And, um, but I think that as we think about, you know, we just had our 20th anniversary a few years ago. And as we think about sort of succession planning, um, I think that one of the things that Maurice has really been doing a lot of thinking about is like, maybe this shouldn't just be one person in charge, right? Like maybe we can have some sort of committee or something because it's a huge, huge lift. So I and some others are um, 
I've been kind of participating in just helping support her in various leadership tasks and um, getting more into the nitty gritty of what running the camp looks like. Um, not just all of the production work that we already do. Um, and this is something that I've experienced uh, sort of in the outside world and my own work as well as this issue of institutional memory, right? Um, and I think that we've done a really good job of, or I don't, <laughs> we're working on doing a better job, I'll say that, <laughs> of, um, of documenting, 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 right? There's some people who like, like the map to build the dome, y'all, is ridiculous. Like it's like this color, then this color, then this one, then this one. And like, <laughs> it's complicated. And there's some people who just know it. Um, and I'm not one of those people. <laughs> Most of us are not, right? And so um, really, I think, yeah, diversifying and empowering other people to take leadership roles um, is something that has already been said, but I think is really critical and something I've experienced both within Death Guild Thunderdome and without um, people owning different processes and then documenting those processes so that there is like a TLDR on everything from how to set up the DJ booth to how to set up the main tent to how to, you know, like organize dome struts by color. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, and I think that, you know, like what someone said, the sort of apprenticeship piece, um, I think that you know, in identifying people who uh, want to come forward. I mean, of course, it's also really important to think about who it is that you're identifying. And um, is it like the obvious person or is it maybe someone who's a little bit more soft-spoken but would do a really, really good job? Um, what does the diversity look like in terms of who we are asking and promoting to be our camp leads, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's been a lot of really good stuff said here. And one thing that really did kind of catch my, catch my ear, I don't think that's actually a phrase it is now, is that, um, is the idea of sort of switching things up, right? Um, obviously we've been doing the same thing for a long time and it's a little different every year, but um, that is something that we've been thinking a lot about for this year is um, how can we add additional, more theatrical elements in a way that sort of used to exist more and more ritual to it um, in a way that allows newer folks to get creative and like contribute something that feels a little bit more their own, I guess, to the, to that, um, to the show. Yeah. Just curious about the, I mean, since Death Guild has a very clear aesthetic and kind of philosophy, if I even know what it is, but I have a sense of it, right? Um, I mean, how, how much does that, play into finding the right people to bump up, you know, to kind of ma manage that or change it, you know? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, I think that like we, I don't think we would ever sort of pull someone in from the outside who hasn't already been part of camp for hmm. a while, right? Um, like the people like, if you're gonna lead camp, like you have to like all the assholes in the camp. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and want to you know and it is a really really tight-knit community i mean we've been doing other camping trips um throughout the pandemic with each other a few times a year we're actually doing one next weekend and um and so it you know it really it really is our like our chosen family and so i think that um by the time it comes to someone actually wanting to sort of step up and take on more of that role. Mm -hmm. um, like they're already part of the culture. And, um, and that doesn't mean that the culture can't also be shifted. You know, I think there's been a lot of really intentional work that Marisa especially has done on the culture within our own camp and um, making eliminating toxic elements, which is something that I've really, really really um, appreciated and admired watching her do and then trying to now kind of do too. Right on, thank you. That's really great information. I wanted to jump in, this is Leslie. I see Opal with Dustfish has a hand raised. So I wanted to give you the floor. Um, I, I just wanted to speak uh, because Dustfish has been around as long as Thunderdome. And uh, what we've done is completely opposite. So every year 
we have a different frontage. And so many people don't recognize us because each year we have a different setup. So, um, so we actually started in 1999 and we've been on the playa all the way till 2019. But because we always look different, no one knows who we are. That's one thing, but that is totally based on having younger people come up and uh, bring us their concepts and ideas. So we've told every time someone says, I think I can do this for you guys. I think I could do sound or lighting or stage. We've been okay and we've supported that. And I think that has given us longevity. Um, the, also, the really interesting thing about succession, um, I too think about that a lot because now after 20 years, there's a lot invested and a lot accumulated and who belongs to this stuff, you know? Um, fortunately, one of our leads has some land purchased some land from some other burners very cheaply. So we have a place to um, camp out at, but this is quite unusual. And, um, but it still, it, it still makes me want to think I want the camp to go on. I, as, and so also the camp was started by a gay man and he was my, I would say my lifelong partner. And he died about eight years ago. And I took over the camp, I'm, I'm gonna say, because I was in grief and, and I didn't know what else to do except lead a Burning Man camp. And so I've done it every year and I kind of do it intuitively and heartfeltly, but not like egomaniacly, you know? I do it very quietly and softly. Um, and I do it as, um, because I believed in his philosophy of life, his, his joy of life. Um, but I keep wanting to get more and more like women to be leads. And it's really hard. Like I, I keep saying this over and over when I'm in public, we're always looking for women because it's not typical for women to have leadership roles but it's so often, and I, and I would say Death Guild is a perfect example of, you know, there's a woman in charge and she's thinking about it. I mean, I'm in the same boat. It's like there's not enough women in leadership positions. And if there's one thing I can do, it would be to help and booster more women to, to be in a leadership position. Death Guild is on the Esplanade. We are on the Esplanade. I don't really know that many camps that have female leads on the Esplanade. That in itself is very hard. And, and I remember all the years that I've had to kind of defend our land and um, you know, believe in, in once again in my concepts of being nonviolent. You know, I mean, there's just been some intense stuff on the playa. So um, so I feel that um, this has been wonderful to listen to all of this and I really want to um, help support more people. We've been able to do it physically with our stage, with our space. Um, it's just, it's been very hard to do it, put people in leadership roles. I'm still working on that one. Girl, we all are. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It sounds like, uh, yeah, thank you for sharing, because that is a, an amazing gift that you have given all of us, and I totally, um, yeah, like, your story is incredibly beautiful, and also, I'm curious, like, do you have, um, a, like, in your camp, do you have a, a decent, like, percentage of women that are camping with you? Well, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting, because, um, we do have a decent amount of women. And we, I think one of the things, one of the secrets of our camp is women can be as sexy as they want and completely protected. So, um, I mean, we've put on cabaret shows. We have women that, that build naked. And um, if anyone comes outside of our camp and, and screws with a woman, Oh, 
they are in deep doo doo, you know, because it's that has been like a generational long thing. Women can be as sexy as they want, and they have everyone's support in that. So I, I think I, I love that. And then also what Kate was saying, um, we've had issues over the years, and it's kind of weird how how those things work out where uh, we've had leads kind of take advantage of women and didn't know about it because the way it was done. And, um, but stuff like that stops as soon as we find out, but it was, it was really interesting to find out that, um, I mean, one year we were creating safe spaces. I mean, ironically, it was safe spaces were being created from our emergency team. And, uh, we found out they were not very safe, you know. So, so it is interesting that happened once, but um, I'm going to say in in the general, it's the women in our camp have so much support. And do we have more? I I think women just because the diversity and the variety, they're very attractive. I mean, that's the other thing. Our camp attracts a lot of energy. You know, just mm -hmm. because women do that, they're they're kind of attractive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder. Um, I mean, there are so many different topics that we could talk about from what you just said. But in terms of like um, supporting women in leadership and also like succession planning, I wonder if one of those women within your camp. I mean, it sounds like you're doing all the right things too. It's like maybe one of those individuals could be cultivated to um, kind of help you in the future too. Yeah, I, this the conversation really gives me a lot to think about and um, and a lot to really think about. But also because I'm an older woman, so I'm I'm in my mid 60s. And so on top of all of this, I am thinking, how, how does one wrap up their life? I mean, how does one say, OK, this is this is good enough life. And now I want to wrap up everything and say, get ready to for the next phase or you know get ready to check out how how does one do that we these are things that our culture doesn't really talk about um so i think it's i mean we're in a way we're all in the unknown because we've all been brought to burning man and burning man has sparked all these ideas and concepts and how do we do the best loving communication most loving way how do we do this gentle way with the earth and ourselves and relationships that are hard you know so it's it's all it's kind of exactly where i'm at in my head <laughs> i would love for you to give a lecture on one of these topics at our camp <laughs> <laughs> well i what i what i am gonna do is um because in the application um I wrote down, I'm going to do um, the history of dust fish um, in my camp this year. And uh, there's a little video that we did in um, 1999. And it's the sweetest little video. And, um, and I just want to do, uh, you know, history of dust fish, of dust fish being on the playa and what that looks like, you know, from my perspective, you know, um, because so I mean, when we first went, there was three of us. And now, you know, one person has died and the other person is not really involved in Burning Man. So it's just been a journey of trying to figure things out, trying to learn, um, trying to say, okay, I know this doesn't work. So what, how, what does work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thanks. Hey yeah. all, this, this is Leslie. I see that Kate's got her hand raised. Thanks. <laughs> um, no, I was just gonna uh, to sort of follow up um, what you said, Opal, was really, really beautiful. And I'm really happy that you're thinking about putting together a history. That's really, really wonderful. Um, but to address, I think, one of the comments in the chat from Mayor around um, well, we have tried to look to women and other people for, for leadership, but um, how to foster that. Um, I think that it is um, one important thing is 
thinking about like the smaller opportunities and growth over time. Um, this is something that I, so I was a union leader for a long time and within that context, um, basically spent a lot of time really trying to recruit women, people of color, um, queer folks, like just really diversify outside just the cis head white male demographic that was really large and um, found, I heard people say to me over and over again, like years later, hey, thank you so much for coming and telling me that you thought that I would do a good job at this. Um, I would never have stepped up otherwise if it wasn't for that. And I think there are a lot of folks who don't necessarily see themselves in leadership roles, maybe because they're not necessarily like the life of the party or the most charismatic one or the person who's always talking in meetings or whatever, right? But sometimes those are like the best folks to have help <laughs> do, you know? Um, and so uh, just some sort of encouragement and thinking about this as a long, as like a long right um that this is the long game that this is like maybe you know do you want to take over camp no uh do you want to like take over the like electricity or the sound or whatever or something or apprentice on this and then like gently sort of as it goes but just that the power of telling someone that you think they would do a good job at it and being able to say something true about why you know like so that you always show up to meetings and you're attentive, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? Um, being able to give them some actual reason about themselves that they're not just thinking that you're yeah. saying that just to say it, I think it just really, really works wonders and, you know, involves investment in your own people and like diversifying the load, you're spreading the load anyway. And then just sort of one last thing too is, you know, it's not also all or nothing, right? Like I'm here today, Marisa is not, Marisa's still our camp our main camp lead right she's gonna be around for a while she's not planning on going anywhere um she's still gonna be involved but i think is like eventually will be less so right like it doesn't have to be just a like tag you're it i'm out <laughs> um but can be really thinking about like a council of people and where different people bring in le different levels of expertise i think can be really helpful too Thank you. That's really great. You're right. I mean, making the, the personal and specific connection to invite someone in is critical. Yeah. Yeah, Kate, I couldn't agree more. In fact, I am one of those people. I've been involved for 12 years now, and I've taken on smaller responsibilities and I have always loved it, but never really saw myself in a position of leadership. I just didn't I, it just didn't even occur to me. And it took other people who I respected and cared about and saw the things in me that I could really d develop for me to actually have the confidence to do what I'm doing right now. And it was, it was a long game, right? It's not that I, I've been equally invested over the past 10 or 12 years. Um, but it really was a matter of feeling empowered by people that I cared about and respected within the community who have been patient enough to wait and mentor and guide and help. And so it's not, it's not an overnight thing. Like nobody's going to look at a camp of 150 people or 200 people and, you know, say, Oh, that's something I want to do next year. Like that's a hard thing to do. <laughs> not many people are going to do that. But when you start to take bite-sized pieces and you actually recognize like, okay, this is doable. I can do this thing. And then you start to become more aware of your community. You start to become more like you're the go-to person, right. And you build your own confidence and, and then you have a support system around you. And it's just, it's, it's like, it just scales up. And that all starts with someone believing in you and, and, and helping you and guiding you just like anything else. So I really appreciated what you said. And I personally, um, I'm very thankful that someone did that for me. Yeah. We're running out of time, Jack. Are we, is this it? Are we, at, are we at the end of our time allotment? We've got four, four minutes and we've got a hard stop at four because there's another meeting coming in. All right. Anybody have one, one more thing to bring up? If not, I think we could leave at this point. Uh, I think it's been a really fun conversation. Yeah. Uh, it's certainly given me some uh, things to think about in terms of uh, succession in our camp. 
And by the way, I don't think mid 60s sounds kind of young to me. Uh, <laughs> me <too. laughs> we have half a dozen that are older than that uh, in our camp. Uh, so, you know, you come over and hang out with us if you want to be around with a bunch of old geezers. <laughs> uh, no, nah, I, I, uh, it's, this has been a great conversation. Thanks everyone. Yeah, I, thank I, I learned a lot and I hope you did too. Jay, thank you for being technical. And no Leslie, thank you for uh, keeping track of everything. And uh, we'll go back now to the, is there a, is there one more session coming up? Uh, a, no, no, I think no. we've got a session with the coordinators and that's it, I think. All right. Goodbye, everyone. And I uh, hope to see you on the playa. Thank yeah, you all so much. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye. All right.